The Life of St. Bridget of Ireland by St. Cogitosis, excerpts from his original writing from the 7th century. The Holy Bridget, whom God knew beforehand and whom he predestined to be molded in his image, was born in Ireland of noble Christian parents stemming from the good and most accomplished tribe of Yoku. Her father was Dubtok, her mother Broksek. From her childhood, she was dedicated to goodness. Chosen by God, the girl was of sober manners, modest and womanly, constantly improving her habit of life. Who could give a full account of the works she performed at an early age? From the innumerable instances, I shall select a few and offer them by way of example. In course of time, when she came of suitable age, her mother sent her to the dairy to churn and make butter from cow's milk, so that she too would serve in the same way as the women who were accustomed to engage in this work. For a period, she and the other women were left to themselves. At the end of the period, they were required to have produced a plentiful return of milk and curds, and measures of churned butter. But this beautiful maiden, with her generous nature, chose to obey God rather than men. She gave the milk to the poor and to wayfarers, and also handed out the butter. At the end of this period, the time came for all to make a return of their dairy production, and it duly came to her turn. Her co-workers could show that they had fulfilled their quota. The Blessed Virgin Bridget was asked if she too could present the result of her labor. She had nothing to show, having given all away to the poor. She was not allowed any extension of time, and she trembled with fear of her mother. Burning with the fire of an inextinguishable faith, she turned to God in prayer. The Lord heard the voice of the maiden raised in prayer and responded without delay. Through the bounty of the divine will, he who is our help in adversity answered her faith in him by producing a plentiful supply of butter. Marvelous to behold, at the very moment of the maiden's prayer, not only was her quota seen to be filled, but her production was found to be much greater than that of her fellow workers. And they, seeing with their own eyes such a mighty marvel, praised the Lord who had done this, and thought it wonderful that such faith should have its base in Bridget's virginal heart. Not long afterwards, her parents, in the ordinary way of the world, wished to betroth her to a man, but heaven inspired her to decide otherwise, to present herself as a chaste virgin to God. She sought out the very holy bishop, Machael, of blessed memory. He was impressed by her heavenly longings, her modesty and her virginal love of chastity, and he veiled her saintly head in the white cloth. She went down on her knees in the presence of God and the bishop, and she touched the wooden base that supported the altar. The wood retains to the present day the wonderful effect of that gesture long ago. It is as green as if the sap still flowed from the roots of a flourishing tree, and as if the tree had not long ago been felled and stripped of its bark. Even today, it cures infirmities and diseases of the faithful. I tell here another episode which demonstrates her sanctity, one in which what her hand did correspond to the quality of her pure virginal mind. It happened that she was pasturing her sheep on a grassy spot on the plain when she was drenched by heavy rain, and she returned home in wet clothes. The sun shining through an aperture in the building cast a beam inside which, at a casual glance, seemed to her to be a solid wooden joist set across the house. She placed her wet cloak on it as if it were indeed solid, and the cloak hung safely from the immaterial sunbeam. When the inhabitants of the house spread the word of this great miracle among the neighbors, they extolled the incomparable Bridget with fitting praise. On another extraordinary occasion, this venerable Bridget was asked by some lepers for beer, but had none. She noticed water that had been prepared for baths. She blessed it in the goodness of her abiding faith and transformed it into the best beer, which she drew copiously for the thirsty. It was indeed he who turned water into wine in Cana of Galilee, who turned water into beer here, through this most blessed woman's faith. When, however, 
this miracle is told, it provides a wonderful example. A certain woman who had taken the vow of chastity fell through youthful desire of pleasure, and her womb swelled with child. Bridget, exercising the most potent strength of her ineffable faith, blessed her, causing the fetus to disappear without coming to birth and without pain. She faithfully returned the woman to health and to penance. And, on another day, a woman from outside the community came to visit, bringing along her twelve-year-old daughter, who was dumb from birth. With the great veneration and reverence that all were accustomed to show to Bridget, the woman bowed down and bent her neck to Bridget's kiss of peace. Bridget, friendly and cheerful, spoke to her in words of salvation based on divine goodness. And following the example of the Savior who bade the little children come to him, she took the daughter's hand in hers and, not knowing that the child was mute, she proceeded to ask the girl's intentions. Whether she wished to take the veil and remain a virgin, or whether she preferred to be given in marriage. The mother intervened to point out that there would be no response, at which Bridget replied that she would not relinquish the daughter's hand until the girl had answered. And when she put the question to the girl the second time, the daughter responded to her, saying, I wish to do nothing but what you wish. And after her mouth had been freed of the impediment to her speech, the girl, released from her chain of dumbness, spoke quite normally. On another day, the blessed Bridget felt a tenderness for some ducks that she saw swimming on the water and occasionally taking wing. She commanded them to come to her, and, as if they were humans under obedience, a great flock of them flew on feathered wings to her, without any fear. Having touched them with her hand and caressed them, she let them go and fly away through the air. She praised highly the Creator of all things, to whom all life is subject, and for whose service, as has been said, all life is given. And from these examples, it is plain that the whole order of beasts, flocks, and herds was subject to her rule. Now this miracle of hers, one to be celebrated in all ages, must be told to the ears of the faithful. Once, as was her custom, she was spreading abroad among everyone the seed of the Lord's word, when she observed nine men belonging to a certain peculiarly vain and diabolical cult. They were deceived and corrupted in mind and soul, and at the instigation of the ancient enemy who ruled among them, they had bound themselves, since they thirsted for the spilling of blood and resolved with evil vows and oaths to commit murder before the beginning of the forthcoming month of July. The most reverend and kindly Bridget preached to them in many gentle phrases, urging them to abandon their mortal errors, to humble their hearts, and through true penance to renounce their sinfulness. But they were profane of mind. They had not fulfilled their wicked vow, and they continued their ways, resisting her appeal, and in spite of the abundant prayers which the Virgin had poured out to God in her desire, following the Lord, that all should be saved and know the truth. The criminals went on their way, and met with what they thought was the man they had to kill. They pierced him with their spears and beheaded him with their swords, and were seen by many to return with bloody weapons, as if they had destroyed their adversary. Here was the miracle. They had killed nobody although it seemed to them that they had fulfilled their vows. When, however, no person was missing in that territory in which they thought they had triumphed, the fullness of the divine favor granted through the most holy Bridget became known to all, and they who had formerly been murderers were now turned back to God through penance. Words cannot adequately describe St. Bridget's devotion to God, through which the divine power of holy religion was shown in the following work. There was a certain man called Lugadum, a strong man for sure, and one of the bravest. When he was of a mind, he did the work of twelve men in a single day all by himself. At the same time, he ate enough food to feed twelve men. As he could do the work single-handed, so could he consume the rations. He implored Bridget to pray to Almighty God to moderate his appetite, which caused him to eat to such excess, 
but he asked that he should not lose his former strength along with his appetite. Bridget blessed him and prayed to God for him. Afterwards, he was content with the sustenance of one man, but, just as before, when he worked, he could do the labor of twelve. He had all his former strength. She followed the example of the most blessed Job and never allowed a poor person to leave empty-handed. Indeed, she gave away to the poor the foreign and exotic robes of the illustrious Bishop Conlath, vestments he wore in the course of the liturgy of the Lord and the apostolic vigils. When in due course the time for these solemnities came round, the high priest of the people wished to change into his vestments. It was to Christ, in the form of a poor person, that Bridget had given the bishop's clothing. Now she handed the bishop another set of vestments, similar in all details of texture and color, which she had received at that very moment draped over a two-wheeled chariot from Christ, whom, as a beggar, she had clad. She had freely given the other clothes to the poor. Now, at the right moment, she received these instead. For, as she was the living and most blessed instrument of the sublime, she had power to do what she wished. After this, a certain man, finding himself in particular need, came to her to ask for a sixth of a measure of honey. She was distressed in her mind, because she had no honey ready that she might give to the person who was asking for it, when the humming of bees was heard underneath the paved floor of the building in which she was. And when that spot from which the buzzing of the bees was heard was excavated and examined, there was found a sufficient quantity to meet the man's requirements. And he, receiving the gift of enough honey for his needs, returned joyfully to his village. Many miracles were performed in her lifetime, before she laid down the burden of her flesh, many later. The bounty of the gift of God never ceased working wonders in her monastery, where her venerable body lies. We have not only heard tales of these marvels, we have seen them with our own eyes. For example, the prior of the great and famous monastery of St. Brigid, of the beginnings of which we have made brief mention in this little work, sent masons and stonecutters to look in suitable places for a rock fit for making a millstone. They made no provision for transport, but went up a steep and difficult road, reached the top of a rocky mountain, and chose a great stone at the summit of the tallest peak, and they carved it all over to a round shape and perforated it to make a millstone. When the prior arrived, in response to their message, with an ox team, he was unable to drive the oxen up to pull the stone. He was barely able to ascend the very difficult ridge with a few of them following him. He and all his workers pondered this problem. By what means could they remove the millstone from the highest ridge of the mountain when there was no way in which the oxen could be yoked and burdened in that high and precipitous place? They came to the despairing conclusion, some of them even giving up and descending the mountain, that they should abandon the stone and regard as waste the labor that they had put into fashioning it. The prior, however, taking prudent thought and consulting his workers, said confidently, By no means let it be so, but manfully lift this millstone and cast it down from the high peak of the mountain in the name and calling on the power of the most reverend St. Bridget, for we have neither equipment nor strength to move the millstone through this rocky place, unless Bridget, to whom nothing is impossible, all things are possible to the believer, will carry it to a place from which the oxen can pull it. So, With firm faith, they first gradually raised it from the mountain top and then east into the valley. When they flung it down, it found its way, sometimes avoiding rocks, sometimes springing up over them, rolling through damp places high on the mountain in which neither men nor cattle could stand, and, with marvelous noise, it arrived quite unbroken at the level spot where the oxen were. From there it was transported by the ox team as far as the mill house, where it was skillfully matched with the other stone. 
Nor must one be silent about the miracle of the rebuilding of the church in which the bodies of that glorious pair, the Bishop Conlaith and this Holy Virgin Bridget, lie right and left of the ornamented altar, placed in shrines decorated with a variegation of gold, silver, gems, and precious stones, with gold and silver crowns hanging above them. In fact, to accommodate the increasing number of the faithful, of both sexes, the church is spacious in its floor area, and it rises to an extreme height. It is adorned with painted boards and has on the inside three wide chapels, all under the roof of the large building and separated by wooden partitions. One partition, which is decorated with painted images and is covered with linen, stretches transversely in the eastern part of the church from one wall to the other and has two entrances at its ends. By one entrance, placed in the external part, the supreme hierarch enters the sanctuary and approaches the altar with his retinue of monks. To these consecrated ministers are entrusted the sacred vessels for Sunday use and the offering of the sacrifice. And by the other entrance, placed on the left side of the above-mentioned transverse partition, the abbess, with her faithful virgins and widows, equally enters to enjoy the banquet of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And another partition, dividing the floor of the church into two equal parts, extends from the east in length as far as the transverse wall. The church has many windows, and an ornamented door on the right side through which the priests and the faithful of male sex enter the building. There is another door on the left through which the virgins and the congregation of the female faithful are accustomed to enter. And so, in one great cathedral, a large number of people, arranged by rank and sex, in orderly divisions separated by partitions, offers prayers with a single spirit to the Almighty Lord. When the ancient door of the left-hand entrance, through which St. Bridget was accustomed to enter the church, was set on its hinges by the craftsmen, it did not fill the new entrance of the rebuilt church. In fact, a quarter of the opening was left unclosed and open. If a fourth part, by height, were added, then the door could be restored to fit the opening. The artificers deliberated and discussed whether they should make a completely new and larger door which would fill the opening, or whether they should make a timber piece to attach to the old door to bring it to the required size. The gifted master, who was in all these matters the leading craftsman of the Irish, gave wise advice. We ought, he said, in this coming night, alongside St. Bridget, to pray faithfully to the Lord so that she may indicate in the morning what we should do. And so he spent the whole night praying before St. Bridget's shrine. And having sent on his prayer, he rose in the morning and brought the old door and placed it on its hinges. It closed the opening completely. There was no gap, no overlap. And so St. Bridget extended the height of the door so that it filled the opening, and no aperture could be seen except when the door was pushed back to allow entry to the church. And this miracle of the Lord's power is plain to the eyes of all who see this doorway and door. But who could convey in words the supreme beauty of her church and the countless wonders of her city, of which we would speak? City is the right word for it. That so many people are living there justifies the title. It is a great metropolis, within whose outskirts, which St. Bridget marked out with a clearly defined boundary, no earthly adversary is feared, nor any incursion of enemies. For the city is the safest place of refuge among all the towns of the whole land of the Irish, with all their fugitives. It is a place where the treasures of kings are looked after, and it is reckoned to be supreme in good order. And who could number the varied crowds and countless people who gather in from all territories? Some come for the abundance of festivals, others come to watch the crowds go by, others come with great gifts to the celebration of the birth into heaven of St. Bridget, who, on the 1st of February, falling asleep, safely laid down the burden of her flesh and followed the Lamb of God into the heavenly mansions. The Traparion and Kentuckyon 
of St. Bridget. O holy Bridget, thou didst become sublime through thy humility, and didst fly on the wings of thy longing for God. When thou didst arrive in the eternal city and appear before thy divine spouse, wearing the crown of virginity, thou didst keep thy promise to remember those who have recourse to thee. Thou dost shower grace upon the world, and dost multiply miracles. Intercede with Christ our God, that he may save our souls. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The Holy Virgin Bridget, full of divine wisdom, went with joy along the way of evangelical childhood, and with the grace of God attained in this way the summit of virtue. Wherefore she now bestows blessings upon those who come to her with faith. O Holy Virgin, intercede with Christ our God, that he may have mercy on our souls.